Good evening and welcome to the Midland Board of Education regularly scheduled meeting on May 29th, 2012. In the absence of our secretary, Mr. Wasserman, would you call roll? Certainly. President Malt. Here. Vice President Wasserman present. Secretary Baker absent. Treasurer Rowley. Here. Member Branstad. Here. Member Gorton. Here. Member Kaminsky. Here. Six of seven, we have a quorum. Thank you. And before we get into the consent agenda this evening, uh, we have a presentation by the Midland County Educational Services Agency Board um, on their uh, proposed budget for the 13, 12, 13, 12, 13. 12, 13. I'll, get, I'll get it right. So. And since it is budget related, I believe I get to do the honors of the introductions. We'll begin with Mr. John Searles, the superintendent of the Midland County Education Service Agency. He has a team with him. I'm not sure how many will be presenting, but he'll do the introductions for his team, and this will be the first uh, you have seen of their 12-13 budget. So, not 13-14. And John, before, and forgive, forgive me for interrupting, but uh, before we get into this, I'd just like to mention that our superintendent is not here uh, presently. He may still join us, uh, but he had a equipment failure in a vehicle. He was traveling with uh, uh, friends from Canada back to the United States, and uh, he was desperately trying to get here on time. Uh, so we'll, we'll see if he joins us. If not, we're in the hands of uh, our, our confident uh, associates and our s assistant superintendents. So with that, John, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'd like to present uh, three of our board members who also join us this evening, Don Shang, Felix McElroy, and Connie Parkhurst. At this time, I'd also like to introduce our new chief financial officer. This is Dwayne Ryle. Dwayne comes to us from Andrews, Hooper, and Pavlik. He is a CPA and has been doing great work at the ESA since coming on board about five months ago. So I'm going to turn it over to Duane, and we'll, we'll do this together. Thank you for the opportunity. As a, as a highlight, several, there are several funds and activities within the general fund several activities within the special revenue or the special education fund. So we'll highlight, uh, highlight these. Uh, we have a debt retirement fund, a capital projects fund, and a, an enterprise fund as well. The focus tonight is really on the general fund and on the special education fund. The departments and programs, substantially the same as what you uh, have seen and, and what we have included in the budget in the past, and that's important because it's, uh, it's really an apples-to-apples -apples comparison this year with, with the budget as to revenue and, and as expenditures. And this is a highlight of the, uh, of the major activities within the general fund. Special education, uh, the same. We have uh, no, no new activities. The activities uh, and the volume within each, each area, for example, the health services or visual aid services, can fluctuate from year to year depending on the needs of the students. But other, otherwise, we have the same general activities as we've had in the past. This next slide is a, uh, is a comparative summary of the budget. The column on the left is the, the budget information that was presented last year what we have in our general ledger this year, and then the columns on the right represent the budget that uh, is before you tonight. What, what you can primarily see in the general fund is that the revenue is flat, and the source of revenue actually for both the general fund and the special education fund are both derived primarily from property taxes. Uh, for the general fund, that's, uh, that's where most of the revenue is derived as, as well as some of the federal uh, and local grants. That revenue for this year is, uh, is flat. Uh, the activity is comparable to last year. We've been very diligent with trying to be a, uh, reduce expenses where we can, shift from employee costs to more contracted services, uh, just being ever vigilant, as I know you are, with trying to do more with less. And, um, we have been able to reduce expenses uh, more this year. Uh, the challenge that we have, and this will be shown on the next slides, is that we have primarily compensation costs in the form of health insurance. Our board paid health insurance has gone up about 16% this year. 
our MIPSers, the retirement rate has gone from about 24.5% to 26.5%. So those are two big drivers of, of employee costs. The MIPSers rate is a uh, is a rate that's determined by the state that's, a, that's required that we pay that. Uh, the health insurance rate is part of a pool. That's something that we look at uh, every year, we look at options to try to reduce and and provide incentives for reducing those costs, uh, but those costs do continue to continue to rise. As last year, there's a there is a slight uh, amount of revenue below the amount of expenditures as required. Not quite as much as uh, budgeted for last year, but you can you can see the uh, that there is a change uh, about 850 thousand last year. It's about. 600, I think, this year. That's on the next slide. Uh, the fund balance, as you can see and as you would expect, that's dropping down as, as a result. Comparatively, on the education side, there's a quite a bit of a bigger drop, and that's primarily two, two areas. Property tax, for special education, the property tax revenue and the levies are really one of the primary sources of, of revenue. And over the last 10 years in Midland County, that, that level has stayed for all intent and purposes, stayed uh, stayed flat. However, the number of kids that we have are required to serve has gone up 90, 98 percent. It's almost doubled. About two thirds of those kids are in in Midland public schools. In the prior year, we had additional funds that uh, we do not have this year. Uh, ARA funds to the tune of about uh, 450 thousand are no longer present. Our Med Medicaid reimbursement for some of our costs are, have also gone down. We're expecting about a 15% decrease in that revenue. And then our, although we're hopeful that state funding through some of the flow through grants can remain the same, we have been cautioned that uh, all districts should anticipate somewhere in the neighborhood of about an 8% reduction there. Now in the prior year, we we're able to take advantage of some of the opportunities with the ARA funds. Uh, since those are no longer available and then with other cost cutting measures, we've been able to reduce uh, the expenses. And you can see that there's, uh, there's still a, a slight uh, uh, excess of expenditures over revenue this year. Um, the fund balance, as with the general fund, uh, we're still dipping, you know, dipping into that, which, was, uh, which is planned. Uh, we're, working as you are very diligently to try to uh, contain expenses, look for innovative ways to, uh, to reduce those expenses. And we've really sent the message to all employees that this is something that they've, uh, as they've always needed to, but they need to be ever vigilant because the uh, expenses are uh, going up, but the revenue is, is really going down and the number of kids that we serve is going up. This is, the, this is the primary source of revenue for prop, property tax being the largest one for the general fund followed by other local, local sources. Those are uh, primarily in the, in the area of some of the grants that we, that we receive in the early childhood area. Uh, federal sources, federal grants. Uh, by and large, the, the revenue in total is comparable, uh, comparable to last year. Oops. The general fund expenditures. Of course, the largest, uh, largest share of this is going to be in uh, salaries and contracted services. In the general fund in particular, there's a higher concentration in contracted services because of some of the uh, early, child, early childhood corporation grants that we receive. And there are contracted services uh, out to other agencies in Midland County for that. So it's a slightly smaller percentage of salaries and benefits in the, in the general fund compared to special education. The enhancement millage is millage that's collected by the Midland County ESA, and that's passed through directly to the uh, to the locals. We are anticipate we're hopeful that, that that amount may increase a little bit, but we've not factored an increase into our budget assumption so far. Intent purposes for uh, this element, we're treating that as the same. Special education revenue, uh, prime. About a little more than a quarter is received from property taxes. Federal sources through federal grants account for another quarter of it. And then intra-district intra sources with some of the you know, tuition amounts that we have with the districts are encompass 
quite a bit of the rest of that, and then also some state sources. The composition of the revenue and the relative ratio for this is, is approximate to last year, other, except for the uh, decreases that I mentioned. One of, the, one of the issues that uh, is important to recognize in the special education fund without really going into a lot of the details is that the, uh, the way the millage is set up, property taxes ultimately flow through to the local districts, as do many of the federal grants. So as, as we take into account the budgeting process, we look at the costs, and the costs are handled uh, by the ESA because the services are mandated by the state. Certain, uh, certain children have certain needs, and then the, the districts collectively are required to, to serve those needs. As a structure, the ESA is set up as a, uh, a common source for some of those services because any one district trying to provide all those services to all those kids results in a really in a loss of the economy of scale because every district is having to pay for some of those services. We're able to kind of pool that, spread that cost out. We, we collect that property tax, but that property tax goes against those services to the extent that we have federal funds and those are directed to those programs, that comes off that, uh, that amount too. So it, it ultimately, the property tax and the federal funds do flow through to the district in relation to the students that we have and by, by being efficient with our resources, we can hold the overall costs of the district down. So that's a kind of a, in a nutshell about how the special education fund works. Uh, there, there's a lot of information, and you may have some questions at this point. I'd really like to open it up to you for any comments or questions that you might have. It's a pleasure. Wayne, can you talk about staffing and where you're at with yeah. the staffing changes, especially in regards to enrollment and that kind of thing? Sure. We're, the staffing is on the administrative side is, is down a little bit. We've el eliminated some positions within the uh, business office. Uh, if, for example, I'm a, uh, w in a contracted services role. Uh, the, the challenge on the education side and with is some of the paraprofessional side is that we're expecting about 18 more students this coming year. The budget does include 10 additional paraprofessionals but I need to point out that those are, those are required because of, of ratios required by the state and, and by the special education plan for, for serving those students. Uh, what we're looking at though, that rather than adding costs in terms of classrooms and in those areas, trying to make sure that that mix is right. Uh, otherwise, other than, non, other than the educational staff, other staff and supervisors, we've been able to reduce uh, those slightly. And I know last year we were able to reduce some of those uh, staffing areas as well. So the net gain in staffing was less than 10? Am I interpreting you correctly? The, <coughs> I think it's about 10. There's actually uh, a, a net increase in the number of staffing, but in the area of paraprofessionals that were required for individual IEPs for the students. So the staffing increases are, are are completely dependent on the nature of the student being served and the disability. So if a student, for example, needs to have, okay. Yeah, yeah. I understand. But it, it, so the, as again, Rick mentioned, a net increase would be uh, 10 pairs, potentially? Yes, for the current fiscal year. And as Dwayne said, we've built in an additional 10, anticipating that we're gonna have a, a, approximately 10, uh, 18 to 20, new students based on current trends over the past five or six years. And, and with that net increase, you're showing expenses going down, both in general yes. ed and special ed. What's driving those south when you're adding in people? Well, a, a number of different factors. For one, we've been uh, very conservative in, in looking at the entire budget and finding a number of areas where we don't think that um, spending needs to continue. And so we've eliminated a number of areas that had been budgeted for in the past that are not necessarily required by student IEP or by law. And we've been able to control costs in those areas. In some other areas, we've been able to shift costs to be able 
to be more efficient with the way that we have been spending money. So the, the net result is, is that either a freezing in many areas or actually a reduction, a slight reduction in some of the areas. And that offsets the increase significantly because that was quite a reduction. Yes, it will un increase. It will offset that increase. Another thing that I think is worth mentioning is that as we work to try to develop, you know, looking at our all of our programs over the past year or so, we have made a number of reductions, but we've also looked at where we can be more efficient in the use of some of the staffing. And we anticipate that over, over the course of the next year, we'll be able to continue to do that. So that hopefully we won't, an additional student doesn't necessarily equate to an additional para. Another area that we've been looking at very dil diligently is the bill back situation. Because that's something that's near and dear to, to all board members across the county. And what we want to be able to see is to, to can we mitigate those charges further through our cost saving efforts and in other ways of, of looking at programming and how we might move forward. Maybe you can just take a minute to refresh all of our memory, but I know we've got a couple of new board members in here. Just describe in summary what that process is in terms of inflows, outflows between a district like us and you and what the build back means. Can you just help sure. summarize that a little bit? Well, f for the most part, you want me to try to stumble through this, Dwayne? <laughs> <laughs> Dwayne's the real expert. <laughs> For the most part, we take a look at all of the, the economies of scale that we have in terms of the teachers, the paras, and the number of kids that come from MPS. And we take all of those costs, and then we apply all of the, the federal fund, the Act 18, which is the, the local tax dollars, apply all of those funds, and then what's left over in terms of each student's cost, and that would be the bill back situation. So, for example, the, the actual cost of educating a student in uh, in uh, an ASD program, for example, might be around $32,000. And so the net cost, after all of the, the funds, both federal and local, are applied, the net cost comes out to be around $6,000. So that would be the actual tuition cost back to MPS for that particular child. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you and Fed charge us an amount of money per student that we send to you. Right? Yes. And you cover all the expenses on it. In some years, there's a surplus. Some years, there's a bill back. Am I saying that right? That's correct. The, uh, the trend has been toward the bill backs because over the, over the past few years, as costs continue to increase and the, overall, the, the, county, the number of students in the county continues to decrease, but the special education population, those kids that we serve as the ESA, are your students. But that number continues to increase disproportionately, right? So over time, what we see is a trend upward in costs. So the costs are, in many ways, outstripping what the revenues are bringing in. And that's problematic. So we've, we've gone back and, and looked literally at every aspect of the budgeting process, line by line, to see what are the essential services that we have to provide, both by law and by IEP, and then what are some of those things that that we can minimize in terms of cost. An, an example, one of my favorite examples, is a student that may have a communication issue. So they may be using an iPad to, to go out into the community in what we call CBIs, or community-based instruction. If, if, a, if a student can learn how to order a Coke and uh, a hamburger at McDonald's by doing that one time, that would be a better use of, of our funds than having them go to some other place that might cost more, like Applebee's or, you know, put in your favorite spot. So those are, those are types of situations that we are examining very carefully to be able to bring those costs down further. If, if you were concerned about where your biggest surprise might be next year in terms of either student count, funding from feds, funding from state, whatever. Mm -hmm. What would be the thing you're most sensitive to in this budget and hence our bill back? What would be the one thing that's most vulnerable against your assumptions? Well, I think that in nearly every case, we've taken a very conservative approach to our predictions. As Duane mentioned, the IDEA, the federal flow through money that comes to us and then helps to pay for some of the programs, we're anticipating, we've been told to anticipate an 8% decrease. If you look 
over the last few years, we, we've seen a traditional, and it unfortunately it's become a tradition, right? We see a, a marked decline every year in those funds. And so hopefully we won't see an 8% decrease, but there is a likelihood that we will. So I'm not really expecting any surprises. We've budgeted the, what we've been told in terms of retirement. That's a huge, as you, as you know, that's a huge factor, that 27, almost 27%. If some of the pending legislation that's on the floor right now goes through, that may be mitigated some. And that would go against what we would potentially bill you back for services provided. Um, other than retirement, anything else on the cost side? that, that Yes, um, is another area that we're looking at is health insurance. As Duane mentioned, we have a bill right now that's looking at around 16% increase. And now that we're sharing those costs with employees, you know that uh, everyone wants those costs to be as low as possible, those increases. So there's a lot of motivation on everyone's part to look at what other types of plans are out there. So that's something that we have a couple of uh, major quotes out still that um, they'll be coming in within the, or the next month or so. Or actually, I think maybe we have a meeting this week, this, this week. to go over what our new um, proposals are. So I missed. Where did the 16% come from? Who 16. Gave you 16. Who gave you that number? From our health insurance carrier. Okay. Yeah. That was a 16% increase over current Is that based cost. on cost going up, or what part of it is utilization? Do you know what makes up the 16? It just seems high. Mm -hmm. A lot is utiliza utilization and, and cost could stay at around about Every year we look at uh, new, car new carriers, new, new programs, meaning that John references uh, is in part to try to get to see if we can mitigate that cost. And what's your total FTE count? Total FTE count is uh, 281 in the most recent year. Uh, that uh, expected to be in the neighborhood of about 298 in the most recent year. Okay, I'm sorry, 281 to 298? Yes. What did I miss there? I know we were talking about the pair pros is 10. What did I miss? That seemed they were going up 17. Where else is the addition? We're, did we're, I miss something? No, we're talking about students. <clears throat> All right. Well, could you repeat your about, question? Oh, employees. Sorry. I was talking uh, about, I'm, I'm sorry. I okay. miscommunicated. Staffing count, FTE count for staffing. How many employees do you have? Same with the number of students. Okay. 238 in the proposed budget or current year? Proposed budget. And that was with an increase. That's yeah, with 10 additional pair pros. So you're at 228 now, roughly, or thereabouts, 230 or something? Yeah. Okay. okay. Total, that would be total staff, most of which the greatest share is in paraprofessionals. So uh, my follow up question to that was going to be what percent of that? 238, 220, whatever the number is, are covered by health insurance. Since I assume you have a lot of part time and yeah. pair pros that probably don't have full benefits. New, new pair of pros are, are not substantially covered by the okay. health insurance. We have, a, we have 176 pair educators, and 35 of the 176 are actually covered on with health care. The rest have no health benefits. Okay. So your number of covered lives, if you will, is relatively small. Yes, it, it is. Like. And new paras, new hires um, with the new contracts have no health benefits. Jack? Yeah. With, uh, with the governor's emphasis on early childhood, mm -hmm. is there any potential for new sources of revenue as far as working with daycare uh, or uh, preschool programs, that type of thing? Is there anything that's going to grow or change in that direction, any emphasis on the early uh, childhood I programs? think that's a great question. The you know that we have a, a number of programs already, w sure. w partnerships with the ESA and, and uh, other providers, mm -hmm. and we are always looking for other opportunities for, for growth or for other partnerships mm -hmm. that ha could help us to uh, serve more children at a, at a lower cost, just kind of spread that out. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, we have a, in the county, we have a model of universal preschool, anyone that wants okay. it, can have it in some way we figure out a way to pay for it. So if there are additional funds that 
are made available by the state, we certainly will be looking for that. You know, we are, um, we at Midland County are already in partnership with Claire Gladwin ISD or RESD in providing oversight to the, the Great Start Readiness Program. And we're also working to partner with other area ISDs to provide that service. Something that you won't see a difference, but most of the um, local school districts outside of our county have GSRP programs that they do themselves. In other words, they, they hire all the teachers, they have all the oversight. And what we're proposing to the other local ISDs and local school districts is that we use a Midland model to do that. What that allows is for us to increase the quality of service to other ISDs, but also to increase that level of service to our own here in Midland County. So that's one of the, the laws that are changing in terms of who can be the fiscal agents for GSRP, or the Great Start Readiness Program, mm -hmm. and how we will see an added benefit for that program. Okay. This might be a hard question off the top, but we touched bill backs, but I haven't seen data on bill backs. Um, what, was, what is our anticipated actual bill back for this current school year? For the current fiscal year. That we've already budgeted against. And what's our budgeted, anticipated budgeted bill back for next year? Need to change slides here. Yeah. <laughs> I'll jump in briefly here, and I believe that in the current year we have over 700000 built in, and it, it comes in two parts. We have the tuition charge to the district, and then we have the Act 18 revenue distribution. So the difference between the two is what we refer to as a bill back, but yep. they will not actually send us a bill for $700,000. Right. They'll send us a bill for $1.5 million and then at the same time present a check for $800,000. And I'm looking for the net. Yeah, and the net is over seven hundred. dollars And for next year, I believe, well, I'll let them jump in. But Well, for, for next year, um, because of some of the work that, that we've been able to do in looking at cut cost cutting and redistributing of, of, of monies, it looks like next year, what we're proposing for next year is that there won't be a build back situation, that there'll be actually a net gain for you <laughs> to the tune of about 151,000. Uh, no, <laughs> we just talked earlier this evening. Uh, it looks like we're down to 634,000. For uh, this year? For, no, for next year. Uh, but there will be additional revenues that aren't related to the Act 18, but that are part of a Medicare distribution that offset that. Uh, but the, the difference just between the tuition charge and the Act 18 distribution will be 634000 Okay, so that would be 634 And yeah. the 150 response, does that mean there's other revenues that are offsetting that 634 even further down? Yes, yes. Okay, and this yeah. year it was 700000 budgeted all in. And that I believe that is going to be smaller as a result, again, of some one-time revenue that will reduce <coughs> it, I believe, by at least 300000 For this year? For this current year. So our current So our current budget. year, I think when yeah. we get to our budget amendment next month, we'll drop from over seven hundred down to four. Right. So net, We're net out of our pocket to help in oh. addition to the the um, additional tuitions, if you want to call it that, is going to be $400,000 this year. Right. Versus proposed for next year? Uh, if you wanted to compare exactly yeah. those same figures for next year, uh, we would have a, a bill back this year of 400 next year about 334 334 Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So effectively uh, across our last a sixty thousand dollar southward less. swing, yeah. mm -hmm. and against this year's budget, about a three hundred thousand mm -hmm. southward swing. Right. Mm -hmm. Was that mostly on the oh, revenue side, or was that mostly on the cost Actually, side? Actually, it was partly magic. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest about it. It's great. <laughs> no, truly, it was on the revenue side. Okay. Um, there were a number, as, as we've mentioned a couple of times, there were a number of areas where we have really made some significant efforts to control costs. So that has helped, but the other part is, is in the revenue sure. side. And yeah. next, next year's assumptions on revenue are incorporating those kind of things so that we shouldn't expect the fairy dust to hit again next year. Right. Okay. 
Yeah. Running low on dust. Keep with magic. Although <laughs> we are at least going in the right direction. I, I like. So, yeah. I like. I don't like surprises. First of all, we uh, get that uh, because we make plans around them. And then secondly, though, if it's going to be a surprise, I'd rather have a surprise that direction. But I like to understand what they are, so that the next year we're neither surprised yet have built in whatever they're supposed to be. Right, and I think that that's important to consider that while this year, the current fiscal year and next fiscal year, those costs will be mitigated. We don't see, you know, right now, what's the fairy dust going to be? We don't know. Yeah. Um, so we need to continue to plan, and we need to be very diligent in, in trying to hold those costs so that we don't suddenly see, uh, you know, another 700 or a million dollars coming to you. Surprise. Right. And our goal is to continue to be transparent. Yep. You asked the question, too, about budget sensitivity, and it, it made me realize that Part of the issue over the past few years has been the per pupil reduction because when they were talking mm -hmm. about how the tuition costs are calculated, from the total cost of the program is subtracted the per pupil amount that is received for all of those pupils. So every district's foundation is applied to those. And you know that every district has lost $470 per pupil, and in our case a little bit, well, actually not a lot bit more. And 281 pupils times $470 is a significant Money. reduction that increases that overall Bill. Un uncovered cost. So, Jen, how, walk through how does the foundation allowance from all the different districts, all the different foundation allowances, pass through and affect you? Just walk through the math of that. We, with our with our state aid, we have. have with our uh, state aid, we have a, a set amount that we're uh, that we're allotted. Then that can change during the year based on student count. The that information comes from the state of Michigan. From the state of Michigan, based on student count, we get the average number of uh, of students. We take we take that total uh, revenue sharing state aid that we get divided by the number of students. Then we come up with a uh, foundation allowance for the ESA. And for the next year, that budgeted amount is uh, about $7,600. Uh, this past year, the budgeted amount was 8,100. So it does it does shift. We look at that and we project what we think, you know, what we think it will be when school starts. That's not, you know, that's always a little a little bit of a guess, but we're projecting that it's going to be downward, and that's consistent with uh, with what our expectations are. And of their 281 students. Those are students who reside in the local attendance areas of the local districts, but are counted as ESA students. They you are. You don't get the foundation allowance. Part, we don't get the it foundation right allowance. It goes directly to them, but the amount differs because they are tied to the local. So the students that live within the Midland Public area carry with them a little different foundation allowance than, for example, the students in the Bullet Creek. But these are students who are considered ESA students. That's their district of record. But their resident district is what determines the amount of their foundation. So the build-back formulas are actually different between all the districts? Uh, no. The county special ed plan is very careful in delineating how both the costs and the revenues are uh, allocated. and all of the foundations for the students within a particular categorical program are pooled. So for example, the students in the moderate cognitive impaired program, the foundation from those students is combined and subtracted from the overall cost to get an average cost per pupil. So it's not as if, uh, because Midland Public gets a higher foundation, that the tuition charge to Midland Public is, is lower. And that's all laid out in the plan. And one of the things we do in the bill back calculation is to um, reconcile the total state aid that we receive as an, as an ESA to make sure that that's allocated back to all the costs that are factored into the bill backs for the districts. And we do the same thing with the federal flow through funds as well. Let's, uh, so we, we account for that to make sure that all, all of the revenue funds from both those sources are applied against those specific program funds. And that comes really off the top tier, if you will, on those costs. So. There's one other question on a different subject. I've kind of lost track. I know you've been through a lot of transition in the last couple of years. Can you just kind of paint the picture of what your, your leadership looks like? I've just lost track of how many bodies you have in administration and what your leadership team look like right now. I'm just kind of behind the eight ball because I know there's been a lot of changes in the last couple of years of 
sure, well, retirements and other changes? We, ha we have done a lot of changing. Um, as you can see, Dwayne, Dwayne is our chief financial officer, a contracted employee, um, 20 to 30 hours a week. Right? <laughs> you pay him 20, he works 30. You, okay. to say <laughs> you, you know how that works. In, in human resources, we have a contracted employee who is the, the human resources director from ITH staffing. That's new and working out very well. So it, essentially, we've consolidated a number of positions and then outsourced. And rather than being in a position of bringing on a new person, trying to train them, to school finance, for example, we started with someone that already understands school, understands uh, finances, and then can essentially come and go. I mean, if Dwayne no longer is able to work for the ESA, some another person from his firm or another firm can step in. So what we've tried to do is position ourselves with, in, with the ability to have a lot more stability. Uh, same is true in HR. Overall, the costs we've reduced, both the HR costs and the business costs, by contracting and going to more part-time. What we have done in the past is kind of throw positions together and say, well, you're going to be the HR person and the business person and really have a hard time doing both of those functions because they are so very different. So we've tried to take a different approach. Also, as part of the leadership team, we have the early childhood director, you, of course, we share the CTE, the career and technical education person with MPS, and we have um, a tech person. We actually are, are using more, uh, in a partnership with Saginaw ISD, we're using Saginaw's tech director as a consultant in working with us and with some of the locals who are interested in that partnership. That pays for itself through services that we sell. So those are a few examples of how we've done some restructuring. Uh, in our shop. Thank you. Of course, special ed director. I can't leave out Michelle Barr. Yeah. Probably why. I know that. <laughs> Probably why. Any other questions? Any other questions? I guess a, a final question. I'm like Jerry, you know, we all, you know, timeliness is important and, um, you know, no surprises are important and we all would like to have our crystal ball as sharp and focused as, as possible and it's easy for us to sit up here on, on the boards and I'm sure your board is the same way. Right. What is your overall confidence level? in the numbers you have presented tonight. And I realize that some things change that are out of control. I'm just trying to get a level of, you know, sometimes they're moving targets more than we like them to be, but nevertheless, what's your confidence level in, in, in the numbers here that we're, maybe a year we from now we're gonna be sitting reviewing numbers that are similar to what you're proposing? Well, maybe we should both deal with this question, but in, in overseeing what Duane has done over the past few months, my level of confidence is extremely high. I believe that there is integrity in the numbers. I believe that where the numbers come from are built on solid foundations, that we have all the costs associated with the various programs built into the numbers that we have presented to you and to Linda. And I believe that they'll be very reliable over the course of the next year. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? If not, thank you, gentlemen. Great. Thank um, you so much. We're trending in the right direction. And right. Uh, good information. Thank you. And we need a motion. We, you now have a resolution. Oh. Or a resolution. A resolution. Oh, later. Oh, oh, resolution. Oh, there's a resolution. Yeah, it's right. We actually, <laughs> where? Mr. Malt, we had that later in the agenda. Five. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you guys for coming. Well, thank you. The board members coming. And thank you for the thank board members you. that are in attendance. Uh, not sure you need another meeting to attend, but uh, oh, thank you for, yeah. for being here. Thanks, John. Okay, moving from that, uh, which was uh, 2.1, we'll move into our consent agenda. Is there anything that anybody would like to have removed from the consent agenda before proceeding? Seeing none. We'll start with the regularly scheduled uh, minutes from the meeting on Monday, May 14th. Uh, 3.2 is the following staff members that announced their resignations uh, effective date as indicated. Three. Uh, if I may interrupt, first sure. of all, don't we have to vote on the consent agenda? He's reviewing. I'm reviewing. I'm sorry. It's all right. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's our Monday on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> It's a uh, three, three budget frame. Yeah. Right? <laughs> three point three uh, is uh, administrative positions that have been um, uh, both 
for 3.3 and uh, Mr. Chapman and Mrs. Guthner with respect to their positions and going back into the teaching ranks. 3.4 is administration is seeking approval to deliver purchase of a tri tri group of from Mount Pleasant uh, upgrading teacher laptops. 3.4 is the administration recommendation of the renewal of the adult education cooperative agreement between Bullock Creek Schools, Coleman, Meridian, and our district. 3.6 is in light of recent changes in laws, uh, specific, uh, specifically additional prohibitive subjects of bargaining. Administrative administration brought for, uh, information on May 14th, Board of Education meeting, a new old policy, uh, and that was uh, m mentioned in the last board meeting. 3.7 is the approval of the payment of school bills, uh, the school uh, bill system for March tw uh, of 2012. Can't talk tonight. Uh, 3.7B is uh, the investment report for March 2012. 3.7C is the listing of purchase orders exceeding $3,000 for the month of March. 3.7D is the listing of purchase card transa transactions exceeding $3,000 for the month of March. <coughs> Excuse me. 3.8 is the approval of the, of the school's uh, bills for the month of April uh, 2012. 3.8B is the investment report for uh, April 2012. 3.8C is the list of purchase orders exceeding $3,000 for the month of April. And 3.8D is the listing purchase, uh, of the purchase card transactions exceeding $3,000 for the month of April 2012. I'll move uh, approval consent items 3.1 through 3.8. Moved by Mr. Ole, support by Mrs. Brandt. That any comments? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Consent of agenda is approved. Request to address the board. We have. <coughs> one, John, Clunen, <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm John Clunen Host. I've got three kids in Mid Midland Public Schools and one will be in Midland Public Schools in a few years. I had just some brief comments with regard to the teacher's contract. The um, teachers are, of course, the lifeblood of our schools. And I look back at my own education through many different classes in many different places. And it's always the teachers that made a huge difference in, in getting our students enthused about learning and showing their own enthusiasm. The fact finder report showed that we do have a little bit of wiggle room in a budget that the um, that the district is not in dire straits financially and so based on that and the other findings of the fact finder report I hope as we go th forward through the rest of this process that as a district we value our teachers and in that way preserve student success in the future thank you thank you and what was your last name John Cleland host Thanks, John. My name is Rick Shaheen. I reside at 2600 Mount Vernon Drive. And tonight, I'm a teacher with the Midland Public Schools. I've been other things on other nights. And good evening, I brought visual aids for this evening. If you'll bear with me. First off, this one represents how much understanding of effective teaching that a rookie teacher has. This one is about a five-year veteran. We'll stack them, it makes it easier. This one, about a 10-year veteran. You can tell I use my Tupperware a lot. This one is about a 20-year veteran. This one, a 30-year veteran understanding effective education in the classroom. This one is what the current majority in the state legislature understands about effective teaching. You may notice that it's kind of hard to see. However, it's the one that we have to see, that we seem to pay the most attention to. Recently, the state, in its rush to legislate, mandated yearly evaluation for teachers. It commanded a rating system, not knowing how to measure it. The legislature also ordered a financial recognition of highly effective teachers without providing adequate means to address the system they created. Not surprisingly, when Dr. Frankenstein tinkers in the Capitol, the monster rampages through the towns. This isn't your responsibility or fault. You didn't do this. However, what the Midland Public Schools also hasn't done is to resist that which we know to be deficient. 
When the comedy club known as the legislature passes a joke, that doesn't mean we have to be the punchline. It's creating serious damage to education in the state, and this board has continued to be silent. Mr. Stamos and Mr. Molinar supported, or actually rushed, legislation to mandate this system. We could either evaluate or attempt to improve teacher quality. The state wants only to evaluate for reasons that our boys in Lansing can't or won't explain. I'm guessing it's rank ordering. I'd rather that the Midland Public Schools work to improve teacher quality. This would have meant a meaningful method to assist students. A meaningful method would have included classroom visits with both administrative and peer teacher components. A meaningful method would have included emphasis on classroom teaching effectiveness rather than meeting room effectiveness. A meaningful method would have been devised before the school year began rather than in midstream when measurement was a moving target. Finally, a meaningful method would have reflected the following fact. If your two high schools are among the top 10% in the country, how is it possible that less than 10% of your teachers district-wide are highly effective? The district seemingly budgeted for 40 teachers maximum to be highly effective and receive the stipend. It would have made more sense to give out $5 coffee cards and recognize that more than 40 MPS teachers are actually highly effective. This may be the problem. A few meetings ago, Mr. Ellinger said that we needed to have a significant differential between administrator and teacher pay, or else, basically quoting, how could we get good teachers to become administrators? That logic is upside down. The question should be, what can we do to keep good teachers in classrooms? I have nothing but the utmost respect for building administrators. They get too many mandates and not enough support. The building administrators I have worked with spend more hours than humanly possible trying to juggle the demands of their jobs. However, a building administrator's main job, much like a teacher's, is to assure high quality instruction and learning environments for students. And the idea that, quote, good teachers, unquote, should aspire to leave the classroom denigrates the role administrators play in encouraging, facilitating, and promoting classroom instruction. So does the current evaluation method, which is badly designed, communicated, and implemented from the top down. The process mandated by the state required transparent, fair, and equitable guidelines. Your teachers can't tell from classroom to classroom what constitutes effective from highly effective. One of the main criteria seems to be outside activities. The problem is clear when you view some of your more talented teachers who dedicate themselves fully to their instruction. Student performance is high for these teachers, but they will never be judged highly effective based on the bias of the current system. Is the evaluation designed to recognize good teachers or merely good employees? Those are two different issues. The method you've adopted serves only to create division with potential to damage, not improve instruction. We don't have to let Lansing continue to damage us without resistance. Unless this evaluation system is improved to reflect cooperation, professionalism, and utilization of the experience and talents of the teaching staff, this district will suffer irreparable harm. The Midland Public Schools has been a great district. I have been blessed to have been educated here, as have my children, siblings, nieces, and nephews. My fear is that we have lost effective internal communication, collaboration, support, bridge building, and collegiality. Only a stronger, more inclusive, more consultative vision can help us progress into the future. It is up to this board to direct such a vision. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else at this time? If not, we will close the request to address the board and move on to our Presentation to the board uh, with re respect to reviewing the uh, bullying and other aggressive behavior policy for Midland Public. Yes, bringing uh, to you uh, for a public hearing at first and then a consideration later on uh, the bullying and other aggressive policy towards students as mandated by state law um, because. Uh, we have a deadline for by June 6th, according to the law, 
Um, we're going to ask that uh, it be approved tonight under special circumstances, and I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, please understand that much of this policy is dictated by the state. We've also then been in consultation with NEOLA, who has helped us in formulating um, a wide variety of our policies and reviewing HMSW and revisions that need to be made there. Um, it's also uh, been checked by our uh, attorney, and there's been discussion with about implementation of this with building principles, and as you are well aware, those of you that are on the Administrative Services Study Committee um, have looked at this at uh, great length. The policy has been on the district website for people to review, and we have published that there will be a hearing, but just for those uh, who may be in our TV audience, uh, we have here a uh, paraphrasing of uh, the essentials of the policy. Does the policy of the district provide a safe educational environment to protect all students from bullying and aggressive behavior? Bullying aggressive behavior by students and adults is strictly by prohibited in this policy. Demonstration of appropriate behavior by staff and volunteers is also expected in the implementation of this. It applies to all school district activities, school premises, school bus, school sponsored activities and events. Uh, notification. Uh, notice of bullying policy will be circulated and posted in all school buildings annually. It will be discussed with students and incorporated in school district handbooks. Uh, parents of victims and parents of aggressors will be promptly notified of any complaint as well as the result of an investigation with student con confidentiality uh, requirements that we have under FERPA. Confidentiality will ma be maintained during the investigation process. The appropriate authorities may be notified depending on the nature of the complaint and the results of the investigation. The superintendent is the one responsible to implement this uh, policy and has worked with the various groups in the formulation of this policy. Student who believes he or she is a victim, this is the procedure, of bullying should report the situation to the principal or assistant principal immediately. A student may also report concerns to a teacher or counselor who will then notify the principal. The principal will investigate and document, uh, and document all complaints about bullying aggressive behavior promptly. If the investigation finds bullying or other aggressive behavior has occurred, prompt and appropriate remedial action will be taken. If warranted, individuals may be referred to law enforcement or other appropriate officials. The superintendent shall submit a compiled report to the Board of Education on an annual basis. Retaliation and in making intentionally false reports is prohibited and may result in disciplinary action. And lastly, the policy goes on to give specific definitions of aggressive behavior, uh, what at school means, bullying, harassment, intimidation, menacing, um, who we're referring to as far as staff and how this applies to third parties who work for the district. And with that, we can have our public hearing. Any comments uh, from the public? With regard to this, this has been on the website. It also was communicated to all board members via an email. Uh, you've had an opportunity to look at this uh, prior to this evening, actually for uh, several days or a week, almost a week or longer. If you, uh... So are you opening the public hearing now? Yes. So is this? yes. Okay. And with that, well, I just, I'm just waiting to end the public hearing. Yes, and, then I, have yeah, and I have comments, too. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Well, with that, uh, seeing no uh, takers from the audience, uh, we will close the public hearing at this time. Mr. Just a clarification, I did see one reference to it, and maybe there's other ones I've just missed. In the, the past, especially when you get outside the classroom, you hear the term hazing a lot, especially related to sports-related activities. And I noticed this covers all activities that Midland Public Schools touches, obviously. And I don't know, are we assuming that the word hazing as tradition is is now being part of the definition of bullying? Yes. Okay. Okay. We That's don't use that term because it, uh, aggressive behavior or bullying could apply to things Understand. broader than that as well. Okay. All right. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Gary? Uh, one comment I have is due to the, I'll call it uh, legislative ambiguity that put us in this position of a very truncated public digestion period. Right. Um, I would like that everyone understand that 
this is not cast in bronze. This is not the tablets from on high. And as we learn and see other things or if other people come forward, the board, future boards always have the opportunity to change, amend, et cetera, as we learn. That's correct. Um, so, <laughs> so one of the fears I had is, was we're put in this position to rapidly do this was enough thought given by other people, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I would encourage those that have thoughts and concerns to continue to bring those forward because there can always be amendments and changes right. into the future. And just a segue into our discussion at the administrative board or committee meeting, uh, there was m uh, many comments and questions with regard to uh, this policy and how it was brought forward and, and the discussions internally with respect to uh, what we felt should be included in it. So um, and we know the timeline is, uh, is pressing us, but uh, again, not unexpected from some of the things we've seen come from Lansing. So. Gary, a question. Sure. What is the plan for um, communication, training, slash education of all of our <coughs> staff and volunteers regarding this so they're aware? And well, we're not going to be able to obviously train all staff here before the end of the school year. Yeah. But what we are going to do is we are going to publish the policy if it's approved um, in all handbooks, make sure everybody has a copy of it, make sure it's accessible on the website. We'll have um, discussions about implementation process through a front office, plus also have discussions with uh, classroom teachers and other staff uh, starting in the fall. Thank you. Yes, John. Yeah, yeah you, you know, as far as <clears throat> what you were saying uh, about uh, having uh, this being an evolving document, some of what this deals with is some of the um, technology related sources where. A kid could put something online, Facebook, whatever else, and not. And I was I was looking through this. So I was impressed that it includes some of those ways that involve technology, phones, texting, things like that, where uh, you could have you know whatever comment or whatever aggressive action be seen by hundreds of people. And uh, I like that that's incorporated. But also this document can involve uh, because new sources of, of technology and ways of, in which it can occur can can certainly. Um, uh, be brought into the document and it, it's it's interesting the emphasis and there's been a number of efforts in the community lately to go over this because of some of this can be done where you're not directly across from that person and uh, hopefully the education process goes to the kids too because they may not understand really what they're doing that may actually cross certain boundaries and so forth and it's hard to really understand when you've crossed that boundary because you don't have to be in the room or even in the same building uh, in which the bullying occurs so correct that's one, one that caution that I would give you is that um, clarification on the law has indicated that if there's a cyber bullying, um, while that is not appropriate, um, we can only handle it as a school if there is significant interruption, interruption to the educational process, okay, if it's not done on the school site or with a school computer. Um, but that c it can be done under those circumstances where it does have that disruption. Otherwise, then it would have to be handled as a legal matter outside of the school. But we have included this because there are uh, those occasions that we run across this where there is significant dis disruption at the school as a result of some of the things that we learn are happening um, on the internet. Right. Kids Thanks. can be afraid to come to school yeah. because right. of something yeah. that's Correct. taking place at Correct. night on the computers in their homes. Right. 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 Yep. Yep. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. Sure. It's good to see. Modern Any other policy. questions or comments to uh, Gary with respect to this policy? not to we'll let you move into the next piece so that we can take care okay. of this. HMSW, our policy handbook, the board policy handbook, chapter 2, section C, paragraph 11, operation of code, which states permanent changes, additions, or deletions may be made by a vote of four or more members of the board at any regular meeting, provided the proposal has been made and supported at a previous regular meeting. Okay, With this time crunch, what we are asking is because of the short timeline given to the district, uh, we are asking that First, you handle item 5.3, which suspends this HMSW policy so that the proposed bullying policy can be voted on at this meeting. We have publicly um, released that and had it on our website for discussion and uh, the notice of the hearing. So I'd ask that you um, first vote on 5.3, and then we'll move into the next item. I'll move. Uh, we take action to suspend HMSW for the... Chapter section three. Move by Mr. Olitz, supported by Dr. Kaminsky. Uh, I have one comment. Go ahead. Mr. Valindi, 
as we as we go through and we go through and we redo the entire HMSW policy book, which is about YOTHIC, um, and we go through the NEOLA guidance, we have been along, we have been suspending some of these things so we can implement new ones that are more critical. So I think there's been other examples of this in the past few months. Right, so. we're, we're looking through the entire policy book, and that will be coming your way as an entirety. This one is it, it has impact this, on this particular yeah, situation, yep. as with a few of the others that we brought to you in the last couple of months. But um, you will be able to then um, approve in its entirety when we, and we're getting closer to that uh, stage, uh, as the Administrative Services Committee well knows after many meetings, um, and can plans. do that. And there will be some changes in policy or the wording of the policy and updating a policy according to uh, recent changes of the law, not just in this last year, but things that aren't referenced specifically in HMSW and from the past. But this is a rare event. We certainly don't want to get in the habit of doing this in one meeting without having an yep. appropriate Correct. review. Correct. And, and that, is not our, input, so. that is not our intention no. to not have yeah. uh, time for that. Part of the problem is, is that uh, this policy came to the uh, all districts kind of late, and then uh, they made a mistake on the date that it had to be effective and sent into the uh, uh, legislature by a month. And so now we're trying to make sure that, as always, that we follow the law to the letter of the law. And Gary, I, I didn't know this bears asking the question before we vote on this. Is that penalty from the state of Michigan with respect to not meeting the deadline? What is the question? Is there a penalty that they can bully us? <laughs> <laughs> can bully us more? <laughs> A board doesn't want to not follow state law. Correct. Yeah, you, you take on many kinds of legal laws. Yeah, and I knew that. I just yeah. thought I'd make make yeah. mention of the fact that I, there I are. Could not advise you to do that. I think just focus on I don't the think you would, Gary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we will follow the state law. The current city president. <laughs> so we, yeah. So we uh, currently have a motion on the table to suspend HMSW's uh, policy chapter two section C paragraph eleven operations code. Uh, motion has been made and supported. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. You have your suspension. Now, 5.4. Due to recent changes in Section 1310B of the Revised School Code uh, prohibiting bullying, each district is required to adopt and implement uh, a policy by June 6, 2012. Administration recommends uh, approval of the attached bullying and aggressive behavior towards students policy. You have the entire thing I sh before gave you a summary of that because of its length. So we would recommend that you um, approve that policy. Move approval of item 5.4. Move by Dr. Kaminsky. Support. Support by Mr. Oley. Any further discussion on what we're about to approve? If not, Motion on the table. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. You have your motion and your policy. So we don't have to reinstate. I, I was going to ask as a point of order, <laughs> do we have to unsuspend the suspension? Yeah. Not at this point. Okay. Not Thank at this you. point. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. We're, we're not bringing any policies for a little bit. We, we may have the uh, HMSW uh, final revised policy. Working no, what, I, what I'm alluding no. to, Gary, is we just suspended. Right. Don't we need to put it back into full motion? And it's open-ended that we suspended the policy. Right, at, at this point. We're not going to leave it open if you would. We don't want to leave it open. We don't want to leave it open. Do we need okay. to do anything? Do we need to leave it formally open? unsuspended? Be safe. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I move that we revert. Uh, <laughs> Unsuspend. Uh, unsuspend our suspension. I support. <laughs> of Chapter 2, Section C, Paragraph yes. 11, Operation With the original policy back in place. Moved by Mr. Wasserman, supported by Mr. Oley. Uh, everybody understand what we're doing? We're closing that up again. That. Okay. Just close All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Policy is now reinstated. Okay. We'll turn to uh, Ms. Klein for the next item. I believe you have a choice of two resolutions in front of you, and we would recommend approval of the resolution in support of the 2012-13 Midland County Educational Service Agency general fund budget. I believe that the resolution is specific to the general fund. I know this evening we talked a little bit about their special ed fund as well, but it is your support or, or lack thereof that's required by June 1st for their general fund budget. But uh, Mr. Ellinger and I spent quite a bit of time with the ESA last week with Mr. Searles and Mr. Ryle, and it is our recommendation to you that we go ahead and we support their general fund budget. 
We need to read the resolution first, or yes. want a motion to read the resolution? I, I think we need to resolu the resolution yeah. first. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I, want, I just wanted to point out I did Thank not you. have oh, a I resolution. Had it in front of you. <laughs> Sorry. Cindy is now going to go get it. While we're waiting, Linda, thank you for all your help relative to You're welcome. Uh, sorting through. Yes. It has been very helpful to us. Uh, I hope it's thank you, Cindy. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, ISD budget resolution, Midland Public Schools, Michigan, the district, at a regular meeting a regular meeting of the Board of Education of the district was held in the MPS boardroom in the district on the 29th day of May 2012 at 7 o'clock in the evening. The meeting was called to order by Ken Malt, president. Uh, all members were present except Ms. Baker. The, uh, the following preamble and resolution were offered by member. We have to put this up for, for who wants to authorize, who wants to? I'll make the motion. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I'll make the motion. Okay. Yep. Member Oley. And Dr. Member Kaminsky. Kaminsky. Yep. Whereas, one, Section 624 of the Revised School Code, as amended, requires the Intermediate School Board to submit its proposed budget not later than May 1st of each year of the Board of each constituent district for review, and two, not later than June 1st of each year, the Board of each constituent district shall review the proposed Intermediate School District budget, shall adopt a Board resolution expressing its support for or disapproval of the proposed Intermediate School District budget and shall submit to the Intermediate School Board any specific objections and proposed changes the Constituent District Board has to the budget. Now, therefore, be it resolved that one, the Board of Education has received and reviewed the proposed Intermediate School District budget in accordance with Section 624 of the Revised School Code as amended, and by the adoption of this resolution, expresses its support for the proposed Intermediate School District budget. Two, the Secretary of the Board of Education or his or her designee shall forward a copy of this resolution to the Intermediate School Board or its superintendent no later than June 1st of 2012. And three, all resolutions insofar as they conflict with this resolution B and the same are hereby rescinded. And this requires a roll call vote. Uh, so we'll take the roll call vote now. President Malt. Yes. Vice President Wasserman, yes. Secretary Baker. Absent. Treasurer Oley? Yes. Member Branstadt? Yes. Member Gorton? Yes. Member Kaminsky? Yes. There are six ayes, no nays, and one absent. The resolution declared is adopted herewith. Thank you. With that, we'll move on to administrative services, which I have a report from May 17th. Um, we met, <coughs> excuse me, um, May 17th to discuss the uh, uh, bullying policy and aggressive behavior towards student policy that uh, you just heard about uh, uh, to be presented tonight. Uh, co committee members also reviewed the 3,000 professional staff policies, uh, 3213 through uh, page 5 of 3362. The section will be presented to the full board for adoption at an upcoming Board of Education meeting. Our next meeting is scheduled for Wednesday, June 6th. Uh, we have several scheduled to continue with a review of the policies uh, with uh, Mr. Allinger and Cindy and uh, our, our NEOLA advisors. So uh, that's our report from that committee. Moving on to finance, Mrs. Klein. Oh, I'm sorry, do we have FO? We do. Yeah, FFO. Do. Um, I'll briefly uh, summarize the minutes of our May 22nd FFO meeting, and the uh, minutes are probably available outside to anybody who's interested in them. Uh, we reviewed the March and April financial reports, uh, which we've already voted on as part of the consent agenda tonight. Uh, Mrs. Klein noted to the committee that medical expenses appear to be running approximately $650,000 under budget, and that utilities are $320,000 under budget, which is good. Those of us who have been around a few years know that sometimes they can swing the opposite direction. Uh, and those are the two major components of the expected 1.7 million favorable variance that was discussed at our budget workshop on April 30th. Um, Linda shared that the Middle Public Schools has been accepted into an energy savings pilot program sponsored by Consumer Consumers Energy. An energy engineer has been assigned to us to assist with benchmarking our building's energy usage and identifying low and no cost ways to reduce that usage. And if we successfully reduce annual usage by 10%, we'll qualify for a $50,000 grant to complete a larger energy-related project. 
After discussing the progress of negotiations with the MCA, the group reviewed a draft of the salary letter that outlines the 2012-13 wage and salary provisions for all employees. This final letter will be presented to the board at our next meeting on June 11th for approval. And the 2012-13 budget will be based on the assumptions contained within the salary letter. Various scenarios and timelines were discussed for budget development and ideally, I stress the word ideally, <laughs> the State School Aid Act of Retirement Reform legislation will be completed before June 1. We've got a couple full days yet. <laughs> if so, the 12-13 MPS general fund budget will reflect those items. If there's no movement on either, the budget will be based on the House proposal for state school aid. In this case, it's likely that the budget presented for information on June 11th will be outdated by the time it's approved on June 25th. Since a public hearing is required when the budget is initially presented, it is not possible to make changes between meetings without holding another hearing. Significant changes will require a budget amendment at some time during the 12-13 fiscal year as we do in the past. So that was our last meeting. Thanks, Rick. Mrs. Klein. Gifts for you this evening. Uh, a number of them have already been received and processed. They total $15,418.20. The first is a uh, recurring gift. We've seen this for at least a couple of years now from the Ladies Auxiliary number 3651 of the VFW and they provide support for a wage reimbursement to some of our community businesses for the 2012-2013 Dow High Work Experience students. These are students in a special education program that are able to go out and gain meaningful experience in local businesses and the gift from the Ladies Auxiliary pays their wages, which is a bit of a, an encouragement to the businesses to make these opportunities available for students. We also have the HH Dow High School Athletic Boosters providing significant support for a number of uniform purchases. And then we have the Kawasi Kiwanis Foundation uh, joining with a number of other donors. You've probably seen three or four other gifts along this line uh, for purchase of a sound field system for East Lawn Elementary School. And then finally, the Northeast Middle School Booster Club providing money for an eighth grade field trip to a Loons game. The one gift that does require your approval is $8,227.59. It is from the Dow High School Athletic Boosters, and it is for football games, for the home and away games. Support. Moved by Mr. Oley, supported by Mr. Wasserman. Any questions of Mrs. Klein with respect to the gifts? If not, we have one that's proven. That's the HH Dow Athletic Boosters football uniforms. All those in favor signify uh, by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. We have our gifts. And thank you again to our donors. Uh, as this is am just amazing. $15,000 in just uh, over the last few weeks. So. Human Resources, Mr. Wasserman. Gladly. Uh, we met, uh, Human Resources Study Committee meeting uh, met on May 22nd at 4 p.m. Uh, we discussed the state of MCA, nego MCEA negotiations. The district informed the committee of a tentative agreement that was reached between the district and the Midland City Education Association. The contract expired April 27, August 27, 2010. Uh, we also discussed administrative staffing. And Mr. Verlindy had discussion with the committee regarding administrative staffing for next year. And the administrator handbook, the committee discussed possible revisions of the handbook to be made effective on July 1st of 2012. And uh, since then, there's been publicly announced the tentative agreement uh, that, we just, that we were informed of at that meeting. Thank you. Mr. Verlindy, HR. Yes, I have two items for information. First, the board and the staff extend their deepest sympathy to the family of Arlene Sugar, who passed away on May 12, 2012. Ms. Mrs. Sugar served as a paraprofessional at H.H. Dow High School from 1979 to 1995. Our condolences to her family. And 8.3, the following staff members have announced their retirement, effective as of the dates indicated. Deb Keister, paraprofessional at Midland High, June 7, 2012, and Suzanne Ponachowski, teacher, Northeast Middle School, July 1, 2012. Thank you, and our condolences to the Sugar family. Correspondence to and from the Board of Education are included in your board agenda and packet. Uh, regularly scheduled meetings are set for the remainder of the 2012. 
and you will see that we have a um, meeting on July 16th at 4 p.m. Before we get into uh, study discussion, I would just like to remind um, board members that this is our last formal entire um, <laughs> board meeting for this school year, and that next time, uh, sh short of uh, cutoffs and t-shirts, um, you may come more relaxed. So with that, uh, I'll start to my left with Mrs. Branstad. All right, I guess I just want to say congratulations to all the seniors that are graduating, including your daughter. And Thank you. Yes, and I hope that they um, wish them well, whatever they're going to do after they leave in the public schools. It, that's pretty much all I was going to say, too, is, is congratulations not only to all the graduates, and we all know that so many of us, everybody associated with the district kind of looks forward to this day. We're all working towards that end, and this is kind of our paycheck. We get our paycheck Friday night by giving out diplomas. Uh, but in addition to kind of congratulating all of the students, we should congratulate all of the parents and all of the teachers and all the staff because they should be celebrating as well um, the end of all of their work both at home and in the classroom and everywhere else in the district. So congratulations to everybody who had a part in making it possible for these kids to, to graduate. So I look forward to it. I also have a congratulations everyone in graduation and a plea for everybody to be safe that night. Um, I hate reading the Detroit papers, incidents on prom nights and graduation nights to take something that should be a highlight of young people's lives and turn it into something, if not tragic, at least uh, not nice. Um, also, congratulations to both parties on the TA. I, I look forward to moving on to the future and uh, things like technology, et cetera, in our classrooms and what we can do to improve that. Um, thanks to the VFW and the businesses that support and hire our special ed kids. Um, I've gotten to see that when I was in the Special Services Committee and the value those students get from that experience is probably 10x the value our other students get in a normal interning situation. It gives them their first burst of confidence uh, uh, to succeed in the world in uh, the world of work and after. And it, it is just so uh, uplifting. And to know what that, just that little bit of thing does for those kids is, is really great. So I really like to thank everybody who's involved in that, especially the businesses. It's hard work for the businesses involved, but it, uh, I hope they find it very, very rewarding. And then lastly, I didn't think I was going to do this. I'd like to give a big shout out to our graduates, both this year and in past year, who joined the service. Um, have anybody watched Taking Chance on HBO? Watch HBO special Taking Chance. I, I urge everybody on TV to watch that. Watch it with your kids. Seriously, I watched it with my college graduate daughter. And we've gone to the Memorial Day service in the morning, and I was just trying to teach her to appreciate the sacrifice people have made that are my parents' age, my grandparents' age, and now her age. And uh, that film is uh, Rick shaking his head. Uh, it should be seen by everybody. It's very, very touching. Uh, and you know what sacrifice these kids are making. And uh, we have a lot of them doing it. And so my hat's off to them. My hat's off to their parents. Uh, one of them is one of our principals that I know fairly well. And so uh, hats off to all of them, and thank you for your service. And I just urge you to watch that. Dr. Kaminsky. Yes. Um, thanks to the uh, DSA for coming out tonight in their budget pre presentation. Uh, Mrs. Klein, thank you for your assistance with that and extra hours. Um, thanks to the superintendent, the finance director, and the board members of the DSA that attended tonight. I know they left. They had to other things uh, uh, other things in their schedule to do um, and I appreciate them their hard work and, and also Linda looking at you know how we can continue to meet the challenges with our special education uh, needs I know that has uh, been uh, increasing pressure as time has gone on um, for for the entire county um, also uh, thanks uh, what Jerry had mentioned about um, our servicemen and women um, you, you you always are just thankful when you look at um, what you have and what opportunities we have. One of that is to uh, to have a great education system and be able to um, have a lot of things in our culture that we take for granted. And I definitely echo uh, what Jerry was saying. There's being a, a former serviceman, um, 
serving during wartime, it, it really does um, <clears throat> make it difficult to uh, to understand. We take for granted sometimes those uh, those liberties that we have. Um, also, thanks to the uh, negotiating teams um, on, with the uh, uh, MCA and also MPS. Thank you to your families all the time away. It's been a very long time, and we appreciate your hard work. Um, and I know there's more to come. Um, on Friday, I'm definitely going to enjoy giving out diplomas. It's my second year doing it, and it is it is really really uh, remarkable to share that moment with the with the teachers, uh, the principals, administrators, the families, and uh, it's just. I, I treasure those moments being able to be at graduation. Even though we're a little hot, a little sweaty, it's long standing and all that other stuff, but it, it is, it is uh, quite an honor to uh, handle those diplomas and I, it's just amazing uh, with what our teachers and staff do for those students. And so uh, to be safe, of course, um, is definitely, uh, definitely always on my mind with, uh, with the celebrations with graduation and uh, some of our young lives that um, can get affected by uh, making poor decisions sometimes. Uh, so um, I'll hand it off to Yvonne, last but not least. Okay. I just want to say I'm grateful, too, to the folks from the ESA for being here tonight. I sure learned a lot about that. As a, a new person on the board, I learned a lot about that. It was very interesting, and I thought they laid it all out very nicely, so it was very easy to understand. Um, also, I was thankful to Mr. Cleveland Host and to Rick Shaheen for their comments. Um, Rick always gives me insight I hadn't, shows me things I hadn't seen before. So I appreciate that. And then I want to say too that I know uh, oftentimes people dread graduation, but I'm looking forward to it. So, and as Angela said too, I wish all the graduates well. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you all. And, and very uh, well said by all. Um, I had a correspondence from Lynn, and she wanted to express the fact that she, in her 11 years on the board, have, uh, this is the first time she's ever missed two meetings in a row. <laughs> but um, <coughs> she's caught up in the moment, and that's a good thing. It's a good moment uh, with her daughter in graduation, as well as I am with my daughter and uh, will be at, uh, on Friday night at Dow High. Um, and all of you uh, that have been on the board in previous years and know what that experience is like to hand your own a child uh, their diploma and uh, big hug and a tough time for a moment um, when that happens uh, <clears throat> with the ESAs in their in their presentation night and again thank you Linda uh, and, and and Carl with uh, that uh, uh, process it was uh, uh, interesting uh, they're trending in the right direction I'm, I'm uh, uh, encouraged by their bill back and the reduction of to our district which means that uh, less bill back means more for us to do things that uh, impact ch uh, children's education. Uh, the weather report, Dr. Kaminsky for Friday is in the 60s, so we shouldn't be sweating too much. Um, and, and just touching real briefly, um, as, as with Dr. Kaminsky, uh, I am a U.S. Army veteran co combat uh, 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 field medic, and uh, this weekend was tough, and uh, again, um, with what uh, Rick and, and Jerry have indicated with respect to this movie, uh, I would encourage all of you. Um, uh, I had a father who was a World War II vet uh, and two brothers uh, that served in the Navy and one in the Army. So uh, pretty special weekend to all of us. Um, and also to our former bo uh, board member, uh, Kelly Buell. His son is uh, slated to return from Afghanistan in June. And a big shout out to him and his family for uh, hopefully a successful trip home and, and all goes well. So to our graduates, um, another uh, great year. Um, you just have to look at the accomplishments of both schools and both classes. It's just amazing. Um, there is nothing um, short of, of, of miraculous with respect to some of the accomplishments that are um, that uh, these students and, and continue to do. And this is a perfect example of year in and year out. So. I'm looking forward to Friday, and as well as all of you. And uh, uh, again, stay safe. And uh, with there, is there anything else, Mr. Verlindi? I'll take a motion to adjourn. It's moved by Dr. Smith, supported by Mr. Washington. We are adjourned at 8:24.